Okay, so we have been busy for a few months now on this whole theme of questions that God asks, and today is our last in this series, and I trust that it's uh, been a benefit uh, looking at these different questions that God has asked us, and uh, it's fitting that we close with a question that really uh, is one that God addresses to uh, Isaiah, but a question that comes to us all from Isaiah chapter 6, and so we get a look at the first few verses of Isaiah 6, and then, uh, as we said, the, that uh, ladies fellowship service next week, and then on the 10th of October, we will be starting a new series in the book of Daniel, and uh, we really believe that, well, I truly believe that that's going to speak into our hearts, because Daniel is just such a model to be emulated in terms of our Christian faith, and so we will begin that in October. So let's just read from the first verse of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The sound of their voices... The doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. May God bless his word to us this morning. Let us bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? Lord, we just thank you for the privilege we have of coming into your house. As Michelle shared, there's just so many millions of people who do not know your grace and your love. There are so many who have the opportunity to come into your house and yet they still stay away. And we thank you that by your spirit you have prompted us to be in this place this morning. We thank you for the testimonies of your grace in our lives. And Lord, may we just count every day precious in your sight. And even as we hear your word this morning, may it not just be another ritual that we go through, where we listen with half an ear and count the time down to just leave and get on with our lives. But Lord, may we consider this time a time when we can just be still and know that you are God and hear you speaking into our hearts. And so, Lord, speak and let us be attentive to your voice, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Over some... 25 years of ministry. I think this passage is probably one of the most quoted passages in the Old Testament. 
um, especially in terms of calling men and women into full-time ministry. And yet, this passage does not apply to those who enter full-time ministry. It's a passage that really comes to each one of us this morning, challenges us in terms of God's call on our lives, God's call to, to proclaim his message in this very bleak world in which we live. And so it's fitting that we close out our series looking at this passage in Isaiah 6. And in a sense, the, the question that we are asking, or God is asking, is one that we will only touch on toward the end of this morning's message. Because there are other things that we need to understand before we can even come to a place of responding to such a question. And that is what I want to focus mostly on today. Through the decades that preceded the exile, Many kings ruled in Judah, and most of them we read about in 1 and 2 Kings did evil in the sight of the Lord. And one exception was King Uzziah, who ruled in Jerusalem for 52 years, during which time he, he sought to restore Judah to a measure of her former glory, as it was under King David and Solomon. We read the story of this king in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and I want to just read a few isolated verses. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God, as long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. It's a wonderful paragraph. It's a paragraph that you love to read of in Scripture. But then there's always a but in Scripture. And that comes in verse 16 of that chapter. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God, and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest, with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord, followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary for you have been unfaithful and you will not be honored by the Lord God. And so here we have this paragraph that after doing right in the eyes of God, in his later years, Uzziah becomes proud and arrogant. And he goes into the temple and he burns incense on the altar, something that God had forbidden anyone else to do other than the Levite priests. But Uzziah was the king. He thought he knew better. And he treated God's glory and holiness with presumption and, and familiarity, flippancy. And when confronted by the priests, he became angry with them. As so often we do when we know that we are wrong and we've done something wrong and we are confronted with it. But in that moment, God causes leprosy to break out on his body. It's a very tragic story. After 52 years of serving God, God strikes him down with leprosy. And here at the beginning of chapter 6, we read the words, in the year that King Uzziah died. That was 740 BC. As I mentioned, friends, before we answer this question, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? There are two things that happen in Isaiah's life that make him ready to fulfill this commission. The first thing that we see is that he sees God for who he is. He sees God for who he is. Isaiah served 
for 40 years as a prophet in Judah. He served under King Uzziah, who, if rabbinical records are correct, was his uncle. I can only imagine how many times he had gone into the temple. And he had probably come out of the temple many times, you know, high-fiving everyone, saying, wow, that was just amazing. God was present. We really experienced his presence. As we do today, and we talk about what a great worship service we had, and we really sense God's presence and so on. And I think, if I think of my own life and my own background in a high Anglican church growing up, I mean, coming from a church like that into a church like this, I would probably tell everyone that this church is alive and we really sense God's presence and God is awesome in this place. And yet there are those who come to Willows who maybe go to another church, more charismatic, independent, and they will say, wow, you know, the worship was so amazing and it's just not the same as it was, you know, back at Willows. And we have this kind of, you know, it depends what our reference point is. And the question that I would ask myself is, how do you gauge whether God is present or not? What is our reference point? But one thing is for sure, that for Isaiah, from this day forward, his measure would be forever different. This day in the year that King Uzziah died, when the earthly king died, and here we have a contrast between the flesh and the spirit, When the earthly king died, only then was Isaiah ready to face the king of kings, the real king. And I often wonder what earthly kings in our lives need to die before we truly encounter the true king of kings. Those kings, those idols, to whom we devote so much of our time and our energy and our abilities and our money. They need to die before we can see and encounter the true king. And the irony here is that as Isaiah went into the temple for the umpteenth time, the very last person in the world he expected to see probably was God. Yes, he had probably experienced something of his presence. He might have felt it. He might have been inspired by his time in the temple. But one day he comes in and he sees. He sees the Lord high and lifted up. The psalmist declares, come taste and see that the Lord is good. And I've said this so often in the devotions over this past year and a half. And we looked at this when we looked at the prodigal son and we looked at the Lord's Prayer. Friends, Christianity is not about entering the temple. It's not about a whole lot of rules and regulations and beliefs. It's about tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Amen? Seeing God, not just knowing about God, but seeing God, encountering God, experiencing God. And I have to be perfectly honest. I've come into God's temple many, many a time and left having not seen God and not encountered Him. And it's all about my own attitude. It's all about my own heart. It's all about my own expectancy. But here we read that Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on the throne. And what does that really speak of? 
It speaks of perspective. As the psalmist declares, what is man that you are mindful of us? You know, one of the most fascinating studies is to compare the book of Jeremiah to Isaiah. Just recently, I, I started exploring that. And what really is so amazing about their calls is that Isaiah enters the temple and sees God high and lifted up and his train fills the temple. And you contrast that with Jeremiah. And you listen to his call, and I want to just read the few verses from verse 4 in terms of his call. And this is so, so vital to us understanding this whole passage. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I did not know how to speak. I'm too young. And the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. And then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth. And he said to me, I've put my words in your mouth. See, Today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Just so far. And so here we have a passage describing Jeremiah's call where it's God who has to affirm Jeremiah, who has to convince him that that he had too low a view of himself and that he was worthy in God's eyes to do his bidding. And yet you contrast that with Isaiah who probably had this kind of buddy-buddy relationship with God. He had too high a view of himself. And what he needed was to see how high and lifted up God was. And how low and insignificant he was. God is so high and needs nothing. And he is so low and needs everything that God can give. And you'll notice how God assures Jeremiah of his nearness. Do not be afraid. But not Isaiah. We read in Jeremiah that, that God touches his mouth. And says, I put my word in your mouth. What does he do with Isaiah? He takes a burning coal and he places it on his mouth. Why the difference? Well, as we said earlier, Uzziah, the king, was his uncle. His father, Amaziah, was Uzziah's brother. He had royal connections part of the cultural elite. And this made Isaiah so different from just about any other prophet that we read about in Scripture who came from humble beginnings, from very low social classes. But Isaiah was related to royalty. And in our world, Isaiah represents those who are raised in well-to-do families. Those who are well-groomed. Those who are, are bright. Those who go to the right schools, mixed with the, the right people. Those are the Isaiahs in our world, those who are successful. And often you, you wish some of those Isaiahs would would come into ministry because, you know, if, if you really gave up all of that and you gave up your education, you gave up all of that and you came into ministry, what an impact you would have for the kingdom of God. And we think in worldly terms of how the world might respond to someone who seemingly has given up so much to, to serve God. And maybe this was the temptation that Isaiah faced. 
To think that God was almost fortunate to have someone of his caliber being his prophet. Yet on this day, we do not hear the same words spoken to Jeremiah. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I knew you from the time you were born in your mother's womb. No, we do not read that. We see that he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And Isaiah had to be humbled in order to experience the presence of God. And see God. You see, there are certain people that need the grace and mercy of God, like Jeremiah, to gain the confidence to even speak about themselves. And there are other people that need an encounter with the loftiness and the holiness of God in order to keep them quiet. Some need God's grace and mercy to open their mouths and others need God's grace and mercy and to see His holiness in order to shut them up. And Isaiah was one of them. And you know what's remarkable if you read through the rest of Isaiah? You know that he makes no further references to himself in the next 60 chapters. And yet you read Jeremiah And Jeremiah continually talks about himself in the rest of the chapters. What a difference. One had to be affirmed by God and given confidence to speak and starts to speak about himself, not in an arrogant way, but in a self-believing way. And the other who was so self-believing and confident had to be humbled and no longer speaks of himself. And then we read that he sees the Lord high and lifted up and his train, his robe, his robe fills the temple. And I, I mentioned this a while ago, but for those of you who don't recall, it's important for us to understand this picture because in ancient times, a victorious general, having conquered a king, would place his foot on the king's neck in the city square and he had cut off the enemy's royal robes and he had stripped him of all his ornaments and jewels. And then the general would bring back the captured royal remnants so that they could be sewn into the robe of his own king. And all those royal jewels would be, would be displayed on the walls of the conqueror's city. And so you could tell how many victories an emperor had won by the number of additions that had been placed on the train of his robe. And here we read that when Isaiah saw the Lord, his train filled the temple. This is Solomon's temple. How many victories do you think the Lord had won that all these additions literally filled the temple? That is the picture that we have in this vision that Isaiah has of God. And so in order to be used of God, friends, the first thing that needs to happen in our lives is to see the Lord as He really is. But then secondly, Isaiah sees himself for who he really is. We read, above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy. In Hebrew, that just speaks of emphasis. Is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of your glory. So what's the deal with these six wings? Well, commentators suggest that the two wings that covered their feet were symbolic of modesty. 
to cover your feet was a way of saying, I'm not worthy. And then you have the two that were on their back with which they flew. And that speaks of doing the Lord's bidding. And then we read of the two wings that were over their faces. And it reminds us of Moses, how he hid in the cleft of a rock when the glory of God passed by. So that he was hidden from the brilliance of the glory and the holiness of God. And that is what these two wings over the serous faces represented. They could no sooner look at the Lord than we can look at the sun. Tim Keller describes God's holiness as his absolute moral excellence. But more than that, his, his incredible generosity. But more than that, his unbelievable justice. But not just that, his endless grace. And not even that, his trustworthiness. God's holiness is like the, a prism where those attributes are like the, the different, different colors that eventually through the prism merge into that one bright white light. That is God's holiness. And when the, the seraphs are faced with that holiness, they, they declare, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of your glory. Jonathan Edwards once wrote a book called The Religious Affections. It's an ancient book. It's not an easy book to read. But he tries to distinguish those characteristics of a real Christian experience from a counterfeit Christian experience. Follow me now. This is fascinating. We know the great revival that Jonathan Edwards was responsible for. He was someone who, who really understood the presence and the holiness of God. And he asks this question, how do you distinguish between a, a real Christian and a counterfeit Christian? And he uses an analogy. And he says, first of all, that one of these defining marks that only a real Christian who's experienced the grace of God will have is that they will be able to look into the beauty of God's holiness. We, we sang about that earlier on. And he says, suppose... Somebody were to come to you as a, as a, as a man and, and say, you know, I just love you and I want to give my life for you. I want us to spend the rest of our lives together. And through mutual consent, you decided to get married. And a week before the marriage, you, the markets crashed and all your savings and all your investments came to naught and you were left high and dry. And you shared with her and said, look, honey, I'm sorry, you know, we've lost everything. And she said, well, then the wedding's off. Sorry, I, I can't marry you if you've got nothing, if you've lost everything. I mean, you would be appalled, wouldn't you? You'd be just shattered. You would, you would feel violated because you would know that this person wasn't really loving you for who you were, but they were loving you for what you had, for your money and all your investments. And so Edwards asks the question, how do you know if you love God? And he says you can't know it if you're simply fascinated by God's power. And you, you talk about God's omnipotence and you, you rejoice in his power and somehow you are able to use that power for your own provision and 
and you say, the Lord will provide for me, and I know that I'll never be in need because God will always be there for me. And of course, that's the prosperity gospel today, isn't it? They're just trusting God, and God will sort everything out in your life. Everything will be hunky-dory. It's like having money in the bank. But he asks, is that really love? I mean, we could all do that, couldn't we? If we believe in a God like that, you just provided for us at our every whim. I mean, I, I could live a life like that. I could serve a God like that. He, he asks, what about the wisdom of God? I mean, if you were using God, you could get very excited about the wisdom that God gives. I mean, knowing that that, that could really come in quite handy when you're making really tough decisions in life and you just call upon his wisdom and he comes in and he gives you the right answer almost like Solomon. I mean, that would be marvelous. I could serve a God like that. It's tantamount to marrying God for his money though. And he goes on, he talks about forgiveness and he talks about grace as we've been doing in our devotions these last couple of weeks. I mean, we, we love God's forgiveness and His grace and in love. We can serve a God like that. We can follow a God like that. But Jonathan Edwards then asks the question, what about God's holiness? And then he makes this profound statement. And he says, nobody but a real Christian could ever love God just for His holiness. Because the holiness of God is of no benefit to us. In fact, the holiness of God is quite threatening if we are not saved by His grace. The holiness of God is only attractive if you love God for just the beauty of who He is. And that is the mark of the seraphs. And that is the mark of a true believer. And Edward says, if you love God just for who He is, then you'll be unconditional in your obedience. If God says, I want you to do this, and I don't want you to do that, and I want you to stop doing this, even though you desperately want to do that, you won't do it because you love God's holiness and you want to be obedient to God for who He is. Just for the joy of Him being your God. But if your obedience is, is conditional, if your obedience and allegiance is conditional, then you've got to question whether you really know God or not. If you say, but Lord, I, I serve you. I go into your temple every Sunday. And yet, I've lost my job. I'm still not married. I'm in financial difficulty. My children have gone wayward. And yet, Lord, I've served you so faithfully and I've done all of this for you. And Lord, you haven't been there for me. You haven't come through for me. And so why should I serve you, God? Why should I love a God like that who doesn't reciprocate? I serve you and all these things keep going wrong in my life. What good is God? And Jonathan Edwards says, if that is your verdict, what you're really saying is the wedding is off. And God ought to be as outraged as we would be. You see, this is just a glimpse of what it means to be holy. When you find your own heart responding to God 
as the seraphs responded to God. And all you can do is just fall on your knees and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We don't have time this morning to look at it, but if you look at Isaiah 5, you have this wonderful song of the vineyard where God laments of how his vineyard, symbolic of Israel, has only produced bad grapes despite God's nurture and love and care. And then Isaiah goes into like a tirade of woes. In verses 8 and 9, 11, 12, 18, 19, 20, he woes everyone. Woe to you, woe to you. Because of Israel's rebellion and so on. You come to the end of the chapter and you're kind of less, left almost you know, out of breath with all these woes. And then all of a sudden, in chapter 6, you find Isaiah going into the temple. Probably his heart filled with anger towards God's people. Everybody else out there. And he comes into the temple and he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And all of a sudden, he's not worrying anybody else, but he says, woe is me. Woe is me. Not woe is you, but woe is me. No sooner has he done that, that God touches his mouth with a burning coal, taken from the altar, and he hears the word, see, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And of course, we know that ultimately points to what Jesus did for us on the cross. When he applies the burning coal to our hearts, he removes the power of sin to define who we are. Our deepest identity is not found in our shame and our sinfulness. Our deepest identity is found in who we are in Christ. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Friends, how we, we need to see God for who he really is. And how we need to see ourselves as we really are. And only then can we come to the question that God asks. Because only then are we ready to see others as God sees them. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah doesn't know himself and he's, until he sees God and his holiness, until he comes face to face with his own sinfulness. And now he's ready to see others as God sees them, as sinners, lost, sheep without a shepherd, desperate in need of his grace. And you would think that having heard this question and having responded, yes, Lord, here am I, send me, that God would have done what God did with Jeremiah and affirmed him and accepted him and supported him and encouraged him. Well, this is how God encourages Jeremiah, uh, uh, Isaiah. In verse 9, he says, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused and make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. <laughs> Imagine the bewilderment, you know. Lord, I've just said, here am I. And the Lord says, well, as I want you to know, that you're going to go out and share this message, but I want you to understand that no one's going to listen to you. That everyone's going to rebel against what you've got to say. 
And yes, there will be an abundant fruit eventually. And eventually your words will be read around the world that for your lifetime, you need to understand that virtually no one will hear the message you're going to bring. Talk about a job description for a missionary. Go, but sorry, no one's going to hear you. No one's going to respond to what you're going to do or what you're going to say. But go anyway. And you can imagine bewildered Isaiah then says, Lord, you know, for how long? Probably thinking, is this going to be a week, maybe a couple of weeks, a month? And God answers, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tense remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and the oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Of course, speaking about the coming Christ. So why do you think, after hearing such a job description, Isaiah still goes out and for 60 chapters we read of how he declares the message of God to God's people. Let me ask you a question, would you? If you were told that's what you're going to do, and that's the kind of response you're going to get, would you say, sorry, Lord, I take those words back. I'm no longer here. I'm no longer available. Yet Isaiah did, and I tell you how you could do so. Because when the king died, when the king died, And he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he saw the King of Kings for the first time in his life. When he saw himself for who he really was. And he was humbled by God. He was ready, in spite of Assyria being raised up and Israel on the verge of total annihilation, he was ready to go and see others as God saw them. He enters the temple and he sees another king, the king of kings. And the reason he's no longer anxious, the reason he does not shy away from the task in front of him, because he sees that God is in control. Let me ask you, do you believe God is in control? In this country where there's so much turmoil and so much anxiety and fear, do you still believe that God is in control? Are you seeing the, the God on the throne this morning? Or is your focus on all these earthly kings that you devote your time and your energy and your passion to? Friends, the only way we can respond to this question, whom will I send and who will go for us? The only way you can answer that question is if you allow the king to die, the earthly king to die in your life and to see the king of kings high and lifted up. When you allow yourself to see yourself as you really are, and worthy of his grace, and you hear the words of God to Jeremiah, I affirm you. I have given you the words to speak. Won't you speak those words, friends? Won't you go out and declare this message of hope and know that even as you do so, there will be those who will not listen. There will be those who will reject what you've got to share, but never give up. Never lose heart because the king is still on the throne. Amen? Final thing. Whatever you do, 
Don't just glibly say, here am I, Lord, send me. Before you've truly seen him high and lifted up and you've truly seen yourself as you really are. Because then you won't be ready to see others as he sees them. Amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. And if you can just be quiet for a moment in your mind's eye just picture the scene it could be this temple that you come into and you long to see the king high and lifted up you want to see yourself as God sees you someone in need of his mercy and grace. And when that perspective is right, you want to see those that he created in his own image. Many of whom who deny him, reject him, ignore him. Do you want to see them come to know him in the way that you know him? not following empty rituals, not performing religious acts, but encountering the living God in your daily life. Lord, we just see you high and lifted up this morning. We pray that we may Look into the beauty of your holiness. And that we will not only see you as a provider, as a protector, but that we will see you as the one to whom we cry, holy, holy, holy. May we worship you for who you are. The earth is full of your glory, Lord. But how we need, as those who go into the harvest field, to share with others the glory that seems to be hidden from them, that we might point out that glory is the one and only Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so, Lord, Search our hearts this morning. And even as we go into this week, Lord, may we consider your word and consider our hearts. And may we go out and proclaim your word for as long as we live. In Jesus' name we pray.